If you have been waiting to sign on the dotted line for a renewable natural gas project, this episode is for you. This is the Uplevel Dairy Podcast for dairy farm owners, managers, and advisors who are committed to profitability, sustainability, and excellence. I'm Peggy Coffeen, and it's my mission to bring you the conversations that will uplevel your skill set and your mindset so you can be a top producer in the dairy farming business. Well, over the past four years, RNG companies have been knocking on the doors of dairy farms across the country country, touting both opportunities as well as long-term commitments. And our guest today has been involved on both sides, the developer side and the dairy producer side. Ty Roloff, Vice President of Food and Agribusiness with Compere Financial, has reviewed at least 40 different project proposals, and he joins us today to share his insights on the opportunities these projects can open up as an additional income stream for dairy farms how to evaluate both contracts and developers, and the details you will not want to overlook when making decisions for the long-term success and sustainability of your dairy farm. This episode is sponsored by Compere Financial. Compere Financial is a member-owned farm credit cooperative serving and supporting agriculture and rural America. Their dairy team brings world-class expertise and tailored solutions to support dairy producers' financial goals and lending needs. I hope you enjoyed this conversation and some insights on RNG from Ty Roloff. My name is Ty Roloff, born and raised in South Central Wisconsin. Been around the farm my entire life. I've got family that still farms cash grains. My entire career has been spent in the egg space, so I've been very fortunate to be tied into all things agriculture throughout all my life. I spent the last 10 years with Compere, most recently the last five with our food and agribusiness group, so really seeing and working through all of those things outside of the farm gates. We put a lot of emphasis on collaboration, partnerships with other farm credits, other lenders, and really respect that the relationship piece there and still trying to serve a need. Well, Ty, so with your position being involved with conversations with farmers, it, it's no surprise that the topic of RNG has been bound to have come up. What has your involvement been like in having those conversations with dairy producers? It's been what I would say a newer found opportunity. So you mentioned RNG, renewable natural gas, biomethane, it goes by a lot of different terms. The easiest way to think about it is the brown rush. So I can credit that to a colleague, Brian Stanek, but really have seen some different opportunities as it relates to dairy, as it relates to some swine, even poultry to some extent for RNG projects. This all started about four years ago on the gas side. Prior to that, a lot of digesters went in. They were able to produce renewable electricity with that gas. Since that time, and for a lot of different factors, there's been some new avenues to move into refining and cleaning up that gas and getting it right into the pipeline. So it's been a really good opportunity for those that are appealing given geographic region size, several different factors, but it truly is a great add-on for these dairies to diversify themselves a little bit. A lot of them have embraced it. Some haven't yet. Some have questions. Some have had success. So really the full gamut, and this has really moved fast for those greenfield installations. There's been a lot of activity over the last four years. I think the current count is close to 600 uh, digesters on farms. And again, that's a multitude of feedstocks but it's really grown and there's probably another 100 under development. So quickly moving um, and can be very lucrative for the dairy as well. So going back to big picture, there's a lot of different ways to make biogas. So we typically think of landfill gas, sometimes wastewater treatment. And really what I call the easy button is um, on animal livestock operations where that gas is able to be produced rather efficiently with some capital expenditures, but the gas is there, so it's a match, matter of capturing and cleaning up that gas and getting it into the pipeline or a trailer for transportation. If you think of it, Europe has probably been doing this for years and years and years. I think Germany alone has close to 10,000 different digesters. They do it for different reasons. They're incentivized in different ways. They're mandated in other ways. We seem to be taking a lead on that and trying to figure out where those installations and those future installations make the most sense. There's this increased appetite on the dairy side for RNG as a possible income stream, but why is it a big deal right now? What's driving this 
opportunity for dairies and where is it coming from? That's a great question. And I would say, you know, if we go back three, four years, it seems like it felt like the wild, wild west. There was a lot going on. A lot of dairies doors are being knocked on. It was new to most, and there was just a lot of information flowing out there. So it was hard to understand what makes the most sense for my operation. So as we fast forward, there's a lot of quality developers out there that have put projects um, together, have projects in their pipeline. So that conversation really starts with the developer identifying either size and scope, what makes the most sense for them from an economical standpoint. These projects can be very capital intensive, depending on where they're located to a pipeline is one large factor. So there's that, and then geographically, there's different pockets of dairy. I would say the, the concentrations that we see most on the dairy side are probably up in the Northeast, maybe the New York region, but the Eastern Dairy Belt, Wisconsin, obviously, some to some extent, Minnesota. South Dakota has been another area given the growth in the dairy segment. And then probably down along California, uh, maybe into the Southeast or Southwest, Given that dairy concentration, and then California specifically has some different programs to encourage their dairy farmers to put these installations in, they incentivize that in a couple different ways. So as you said, we're starting to, over the past four years, this Wild West is starting to really take root throughout the major dairy pockets of the U.S. And many of the producers that you work with many of the producers that i talk to on a regular basis they may be in that stage where they've already signed a contract and they have a project that is starting to take action or or is being built right now but there are others out there that are in the spot where they're looking at their desk and they may have a couple of different contracts from different rng companies that are laid out in front of them and so Ty, I think one of the greatest values that that you can bring to our dairy producers and the key advisors that sit close to them on this podcast today is really breaking out what should they be looking at when you have multiple contracts and making the best decision. Because when we're talking about the, these decisions of which company to, to partner with and what type of commitment you want to legally bind yourself to. Um, in some cases, it's a 20 year decision. And so back it out, take it apart. If I'm a dairy producer and I've got a few contracts and a few different options in front of me, what should I be thinking about in order to make the best decision for the future of my dairy? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I think what dairy producers know really, really well is how to produce great milk. Um, from there, you've got something that looks and feels totally different. So where do you even start, right? And I think <clears throat> most of these dairies have done a good job of putting the right team around them, whether that's accountants, advisors, consultants, uh, CPAs, attorneys. So I think the first thing to understand is having somebody take a look at that that doesn't have an interest in the project. So you had touched on the legal piece of a little bit. What, what are the contractual obligations of the dairy? These aren't short-term transactions. As you mentioned, they can be up to 20 years in length or that agreement or that manure supply agreement could last. So it's very important that if you're signing up for that long-term agreement, what does that look like down the road, not just today? So I think that's one part of it. Clearly there's a monetary component to this. So I think understanding the impact there that that has on your, op on your operation. The other part is working with your lender. What concerns, questions may they have? And then I think, Lastly, thinking about where you want to go, most dairies want to be here 20, 30, 50 years from now, making sure that that's going to happen. What if somebody were to step in in the shoes of that, di that digester developer? Um, we have seen several of these projects change hands. So that is another factor. What does the future look like? I think the big two things there are probably, what are my responsibilities in this? If I can't perform or if I don't perform, what could some of the consequences be there? So that's really important. What rate might the ramifications be? And then what else? Sometimes these, these agreements require easements across property, different lease agreements around the manure supply side. They may have easements that run to a connecting pipeline. So there's, it's not just I supply manure and get a check. There's a lot more that goes into the contractual piece of this. And really that fine print, I think, is what really needs to be understood. 
and also that you've got a developer that supports you. Do you want to grow? Are they able to handle that additional manure? What might infrastructure or expansion look like in the future? That's really the starting point, but I think the key takeaway there is those third party neutral independent voices around you. What what is their assessment of the project? And I would start with an attorney. So that's in your mind, step number one is have someone from the outside that understands the legal language specifically, would you recommend around RNG if you can find someone that does have a, a keen interest and experience in that field? I believe so. And, and believe it or not, this biogas piece, at least locally here in Wisconsin, there are several large law firms that have attorneys that specialize in this biogas slash renewable energy field. So there's certainly expertise out there to be able to digest what these contracts mean, have some additional insight into the industry. But yes, that would be my step one. So once you've gone through that step of bringing in some outside counsel that can help you understand what the language really means, well, then the next step really is a matter of evaluating uh, what you touched on, and that's the responsibilities and also some of the consequences that could come along with what that language ends up meaning. And what you also alluded to is kind of this bigger long-term picture. If you were to estimate how many projects that you've had conversations about with the dairy producers that you work with, I mean, what would that number look like over the last few years? I, over the last four years, that's probably in that 35 to 40 range, somewhere in there. So and some of these are a portfolio approach where a developer may come in and have five, six, 10, 11 different projects that are in their pipeline. Some of those are being built. Some of them are under contract. Some of them are single sites. So we've seen quite the mix, but I think the biggest education that I've had over the last four years is really understanding what makes a good project and maybe what makes a project more suspect. And I think a lot of that comes down into the details. So what's detailed, what is the background of that developer? What is their capital capacity? So again, these are expensive projects. You need to have half a project built on your farm and there's a capacity there to get that project finished. So I think that capacity piece in what that developer can bring to the farm is really important. Um, and those are some questions that should be asked. Um, and typically do get asked, um, but that's probably one of the one of the key attributes on the farm side as they're having developers approach um, another thing to think about. You've looked at a lot of these contracts and you've had some pretty in-depth conversations uh, with developers and dairy producers. And uh, one of the things that you mentioned earlier as well is really looking at those details of what's in the contract. And uh, you talked about things such as, you know, easements and manure supply. And, and I'm just wondering if you could share a few examples of things that have come up as you've been reviewing different contracts from different developers that, that maybe either raised a red flag for you or at least caught your eye and uh, something that you called to the attention of your clients uh, to help them just really get a bigger picture on the impacts and the contract obligations that that maybe could have been overlooked. Anything that really comes to mind of just things that things that you really had to help that producer walk through to truly understand the impact on their day-to-day -day operations, their long-term future, as you've been reviewing those contracts and being a trusted partner at the table in those decisions. I think that's really important. So from an oversight standpoint and, and really reaction to, I think one of those key things that really stands out for me, and we had a lot of this in the beginning, but it was, what's their background, right? So I can't tell you how many times that we had, well, this would be my first project. And to me, as a lender and as a consultant, as a, a partner relationship piece of that, I think experience is huge. These are complicated projects to some extent. They require correct engineering. And after the fact, after the switches are turned on, you've got to have somebody that's capable of operating and maintaining those projects. So making sure, A, within that contract, really, what is the experience of that developer? B, who would be managing the uh, operations and maintenance of that? I think that's key. Um, and then really understanding some of those default issues on both sides. 
I think that really needs to be spelled out. And sometimes when I go back to detail, some of those earlier contracts was what if this or that happens wasn't addressed in there. And I think that needs to be clearly defined of expectations and roles on both sides. So those are probably the key factors that come to light and that are should be pretty easily able to be defined within that contract. That one of the things you talked about was just making sure that that developing that developer partner is a good fit and has some reliability behind them. What's the vetting process for that? Typically, as we work through the underwriting process, that will come up in either an engineering report on our side of things. And typically, that's something that should be provided to the client at some point. And then an engineering report would typically require a feasibility study component. And if it didn't, that could be a standalone report. But I think those are fair for a, a farm partner to at least understand or be able to ask on what is that experience level. That should all come out through discovery. What we've boiled down to today is I can probably think of 20 different developers out there that have stood the test of time, have projects operating. So it should be pretty easy to identify through some pretty quick research on who's got experience in the field, who doesn't, and maybe who had any developer out there that had some challenges, whether legal or performance-wise. Mm -hmm. In the three to four year time frame since you started really getting involved with your customers and clients and having these conversations, would you say that the Wild West is getting a little bit more tame than it used to be? Are we there yeah. yet? Well, I think we're there. And where I get excited about this industry and where it goes, and I use the color TV analogy because I think it's really important to understand that. Typically, the largest of the large dairies, swine operators, where they can aggregate enough hogs, and even to some extent, the poultry side, where there's enough uh, bird capacity there to make these projects go, have been the cream or the, the uh, top object to get these deals done and signed up. I see that trickling down. So if we think of TV, it was really expensive, it was really small, and the picture wasn't great in the beginning. They've gotten bigger, better, and to the masses now where everybody can afford them. So I liken that to, I see smaller dairies having an ability to be able to capture these opportunities as well, which should help them compete on a level playing field to be able to receive some of this additional revenue. I don't know how, what small is, but I would say that there's technology out there today that exists for a 75 cow dairy. So the technology exists, it's getting the economics right, but I do see more and more being able to participate as this industry matures. Yeah, so you, you believe that there's a, a strong future for uh, RNG in these conversations to not just be a, a fad, but truly a long standing piece of, at the end of the day, sustainability and profitability. And I'm saying sustainability in two forms, right? We have sustainability from an environmental side, but also the potential to generate an income stream is sustainability on the financial side. You're correct. It checks both of those boxes. So am I optimistic long term? I am. I think there's other technologies that go along with this that's able to be bolted on. So when we think of nutrient concentration, um, that, that could be done with these systems. Are they generating, are they going back to generate electricity, which then powers electric cars? So now you've got green electricity going into a green vehicle. That's very possible. What else can they do with those molecules? Is it green methane, green hydrogen? Um, possibly, and what are some other uses for those products? So I think there's a lot of things that can be done right now. RNG as it stands um, is used pretty heavily in the transportation field. We've also got some municipalities that um, find an interest or have targets where they're utilizing this gas. So I would say between the regulated space and the voluntary space, there's definitely interest. And in where all that rolls up to it, sustainability is a big term, a broad term, but it does play its part into that. And I think on the processing side, processors are more keenly aware of what does sustainability mean to them. And ultimately that flows down. And I think that this, this is certainly a component of sustainability. And farmers are always trying to do a better job today than they did yesterday. So this fits into the future, I think, very nicely. And that's why I am excited about that this is going to be a long-term opportunity for many to participate in. 
Well, thanks for sharing your perspective on this, Ty, and your experience of being, oh, maybe in some cases, elbow, elbow deep or knee deep into contracts and other things that go through digesters. As we kind of wrap up here, a question that I have for you is, if you were the dairyman right now, and at that desk that you're sitting at right in front of you, you had an RNG contract and you got to take your red pen and mark it up so that it would be the best contract and benefit to you and your operation, what would you make sure was included? I, well, there's probably two things. I think, you know, given the right dairy that maybe hadn't done something today, I think there's still some leverage on that side. So I think the first thing would be, what is my maximum revenue potential? So I think that's number one. What does that look like? How does that impact my herd and what's required of me? I think the second thing is we all know that unexpected things can happen. So I would say that if the unexpected happens to make sure that there's enough cure time to resolve whatever that issue might be, because at the end of the day, the dairy is the core piece of the business. This is a great supplement for those that are able to participate. But I think that's those are the, probably the two key factors where I would take my red pen and want to make sure that those two items were probably in my favor to the extent that they could be. Going back to you're the dairyman and you've got the contract and you've got your red pen out. I've had some producers tell me that they're working with developers that say that they don't have to switch from sand. We know how important the betting topic is, how it's been, how it's evolved, but there are those technologies out there that can solve that. So that shouldn't be a hard stop on whether a project moves forward or not. The technology exists to continue using sand. And I would say that there's certainly a return on that if that's something that you're looking at. Established companies, established projects here within the U.S. where that's happening today, they're running digesters. So no, that should not be a hard stop. If you're on sand bedding today, thinking about switching, sand can be acceptable. What's the number um, one question you get? My primary role is probably more with the developers than the actual dairy farms themselves. I know our dairy, team, dairy lending team probably has some different conversations. I think there's a lot of reliance on their lender, again, as their trusted partner to understand the numbers, maybe work through some of that. What is the impact on that? So I don't think it's a bad thing. And when I go back to that network to make sure that your lender is a part of that equation, what does it mean? What, what might their considerations mean? Does that allow you to grow, for example? So that, that revenue piece can be very helpful. It looks different for everybody. So I would say the one thing to keep in mind is if a neighbor or somebody within your peer group has a deal that looks like X, your deal could certainly look like Y for a variable, for a lot of different reasons. It's not one size fits all. So there, these contracts are negotiated on a case by case basis. So I would say that the expectation shouldn't be, your deal could be better, it might not be as lucrative, but certainly something to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, so as you said, you work a lot on the developer side. Your team is also very involved uh, with the producer side as well. And so for our listeners out there that just would like a place to go for a little bit more information, to find some resources, to know who their next call can be as they're going through decision making, is that something that Compere has available as well that we can put in our show notes? That is absolutely, I uh, would certainly love to entertain any questions that are out there. There's others that have some experience as well. And maybe that testimonial piece from those that have clients that have gone through the process. I certainly think we're, we're very willing to share what that experience looks like. There's a company um, that's sponsored by some of the co-ops out there called Nutrient. They're another third party independent company that's out there that will help on the, out of the farm gate understand what that impact might be. So that's another resource. And I would say from a, from a biogas industry representation standpoint, the American Biogas Council, you can find their information online. They're an excellent resource to understand what does the bigger picture look like? What is biogas? What do the markets look like? So if you're into understanding, you know, where might this gas go? What does it look like? That's another resource that you could certainly utilize. Happy to help in any way that I can um, and just love being able to share some of the knowledge I've gained over the last four years. Excellent. So there you have it in our show notes. You can connect with Compere. You can connect with some other resources that you'll be able to find. And we'll make sure we have a direct contact right to you, Ty. So people can give you a call and pick your brain when they're uh, when they're looking to make the best decision for their dairy and for their future. Anything else you'd like to add? 
AJ, I'm just glad I get to share this with you because I try to come home and tell my wife and kids about renewable natural gas. and I get excited about it. They have zero excitement for it. So I think in closing, it's a great opportunity. There's a lot of probably good offers if you haven't done anything else yet today that are out there and probably look very favorable. Take the time to understand what that means for you, your future, what your responsibilities are, and work with that trusted network that you've got to make sure that it's a deal that fits for you and that's not going to cause any complications with your normal job of producing world-class dairy products. And so with that, thank you so much for joining us on the Up Level Dairy Podcast. Peggy, I really appreciate it. And um, thank you for all the work that you do for the dairy industry. Oh, well, thank you as well. Thank you for listening to the Up Level Dairy Podcast. This episode with Ty Roloff was sponsored by Compeer Financial. Compeer Financial is a member-owned farm credit cooperative serving and supporting agriculture and rural America. Their dairy team brings world-class expertise and tailored solutions to support dairy producers' financial goals and lending needs. You can find all the contact information for Ty and the rest of the team at Compeer in our show notes. I'm Peggy Coffeen, and thank you so very much for listening to this episode of the Up level dairy podcast. 